Today's talk is on Lorenzo Lotto, one of the great portraitists of the Renaissance and one of the great portraitists of all time because of the psychological depth he captured. But after his death, he was largely forgotten about and was rediscovered at the end of the 19th century. And today his reputation grows and grows and is now seen as one of the first modern portrait painters. Let's though look at his life in summary. He was born in Venice. We don't know where he was trained or under what artists. His work shows he was clearly influenced by Giorgione and Giovanni Bellini, so he probably trained in Venice. Up here, when he was 23, he lived in Treviso, just north of Venice, for three years. And by that stage, he was described there as a very famous painter. So he was already well known. And from there, he travelled down to Asolo, or sorry, a cross or west to Asolo, um, still in the Veneto. He then moved down here, that says Recanati, and that's in this area here called the Marche. And by then his portraits had already achieved a great emotional intensity and he was a well-known artist. So that in 1509 he visited Rome for three years, worked under Raphael, worked on the Stanze in the Vatican, then from 1513 to 1525 he lived up here in Bergamo and that was the high point of his personal life, high point of his career. He became the city's leading artist and in fact it was the happiest time of his life. He was producing portraits for the wealthy emerging middle class and he was known for his um, level of detail in his portraits and his clever symbolism. And then in 1525, he went back to Venice where he was born and lived there for eight years. He was successful, but of course the major artist in Venice at the time was Titian and he never equaled Titian, but he was, if you like, the rival of Titian as one of the leading artists in the city. Then from 1533 he travelled a lot. So he travelled down around the Marquet, he travelled back to Venice, he travelled to Treviso and back. And we've got a lot of information about this period because he kept a, a diary in his accounts book. We know he lived beyond his means, he said so, he had to auction his work. It didn't raise enough money. He became poor. He lost um, his reputation. He wasn't so uh, widely commissioned. He became depressed and isolated. But it was about this time that he produced some of his most penetrating portraits. And then in the last decade of his life, 1546 to 56, he retired to Loreto, which is um, down here, and he became a lay brother and um, died in Loreto. But let's um, start with a self portrait. He was a prolific artist and um, he produced his notable work, his best known work between 1513 and 1525, as we'll see. He signed a lot of his work, and so we know when it was painted, and we've got a fair idea, uh, some works are attributed to him, but we've got a fair idea of which works are his. 
Incidentally, the idea that this is a self-portrait is only a recent suggestion. We don't know that it is a self-portrait. We don't really know what he looked like, but it's assumed to be a self-portrait because of the position of the head and the gaze. It looks as though he's looking in a mirror to paint it. That's really the only evidence we have that this is a self-portrait. And this is an early work. Um, this type of restrained portrait. He usually has a curtain behind, uh, but in this case it's replaced by this intense green colour, which is um, used as a contrasting tone to the flesh colour of the face. A well-known, one of his well-known works, uh, now in Bergamo, who has, uh, Bergamo has a good collection of his work. This is Portrait of a Young Man, um, less well known perhaps, perhaps because of its simplicity. It has a, though a remarkable power. Notice the way he scrupulously renders every detail and note the luminous intensity of the face. It's a, if we look closely, a smooth oval face probably a young man not long past adolescence. It's almost angelic, except perhaps for the penetrating eyes, drowsy eyelids that seem to veil his gaze and produce a sort of sensual look. The eyes have got um, an enigmatic quality. It, it's very difficult to interpret what he's thinking. He's wearing a black beret, which you can just make out against the background. And the inclination of his head makes the the oval, the perfect oval of his face, unstable on this um, sort of almost marble column like neck. And that um, off center aspect adds a certain tension to the picture. And then to finish it off, there's a balustrade in a light coloured stone at the bottom that distances ourself uh, from him and completes the picture. This is his earliest known religious picture. He was a very religious person. He painted a large number of religious subjects, but today I'm going to be concentrating on his portraits. But I thought I'd show you one of his religious works. This is Saint Peter Martyr. He was struck on the head with an axe and stabbed by assassins. If you look at the face of St. Peter Martyr, it looks very uh, distinctive, like um, an actual person. It's not idealised. So it's possible that um, he based it on a portrait of someone he knew, perhaps a Dominican priest he knew. It once contained a portrait of his patron, Bishop Bernardo de Rossi of Treviso, and we'll see his portrait next. And that was painted out. It was replaced by the infant St. John the Baptist, uh, centre bottom of this picture. And it was probably commissioned by the bishop, Bishop Rossi, because there had been an unsuccessful murder attempt on his life that was um, planned for the 29th of September 1503. So what we see here is um, a close-up of a brutal, in this case, martyrdom in what was unusual for this time to show a martyrdom like this in a personal devotional piece. Uh, perhaps it was so the bishop could reflect on the attempt on his own life. From the beginning of his career, he had intense personal religious beliefs and he was interested in the individual rather than idealised stereotypes copied from model books. So this is the bishop. And um, by the age of 25, Lotto had won the uh, prestigious patronage of 
this bishop, Bishop Rossi. And now, like many portraits at the time, it was stored or, or displayed in a shallow box with a door on it. And these portrait covers are mostly now lost. Very few survive. When you open the door, on the inside of the door, there was the title, signature and date. And on the front of the door, there was um, typically an allegorical painting and the one for the door of this portrait we'll see next. As you can see, he's as typically he painted with striking realism. The bishop has a reddish complexion, expressive blue eyes. You can even see his minor skin imperfections. His hair is curling for un from under his black beretta. And he, Lotto wasn't the only person to paint with such detail. He was inspired by Antonello de Messina, and he was influenced, we believe, by Flemish art, including artists such as Albrecht Dürer. And, and in fact, Dürer's drawings could have been seen by Lotto. And here again, uh, is a green background. This time it's a curtain, but the green of the curtain uh, contrasts with the, the red of the cape and the face. Um, a common technique of Venetian painting. It's possible that the role he's holding is the uh, sentence against those who attempted to take his life two years before. And this is just to show you a close up of the face, the blue eyes, the hair curling out from under his beretta. And this is the uh, painting that was on the front of the door of the box that contained that portrait. So it protected it and it was opened to display the portrait and when opened you could see on the inside of the door the name, age, date and artist. And typically there is a lot of symbolism in these these doors and the symbolism helps define the portrait sitter's personal history, their values and virtues. And what we see here are the two sides of the person. On the right, the darker side, and on the left, the light side. So on the right, here's um, magnification. We see symbols of vice, a satyr, carnal desire. There's a white urn spilling wine onto the ground. There's a ladle containing some milk and an earthenware urn spilling milk. The spilling of milk symbolizing the failure of good beginnings. There's a dark wood behind and in, in the sea, you can just about make out it's a ship sinking again, symbolising failure. But on the tree trunk in the centre, there's a new fresh branch springing out to the left. At the base, there's a shield containing a lion, and the lion was part of the seal of the bishop. There's a naked child holding dividers with instruments representing geometry, music, which were two of the liberal arts, so representing intellectual activities. On the tree, there's a shield that's transparent, but you can make out the head of a gorgon, which may be def a defense of the soul. So the complete picture is a treatise on the human soul with its carnal desires on the right and the rational mind on the left, which when in balance 
can lead to a mystical union with God, signified by the mountain on the left with a winged cherub ascending to the top of the mountain, which is covered in clouds. So in other words, it's telling us that the bishop has overcome his carnal desires and is using his intellect to reach up towards God. Now, Lotto painted relatively few female portraits. This is just called Portrait of a Lady, and it's the earliest to survive. It's, um, it's got a strong resemblance in some ways to the portrait of the bishop we just saw. And also we have the, um, the portrait cover, and on it, there's a another allegory called Maiden's Dream, shown here. It's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. She wears no jewellery. Her light brown hair is pulled back in a net cap. It was formerly, by the way, attributed to Holbein, Hans Holbein the Younger. There's no attempt to flatter and some people have suggested, because of the similarity of the look, that it's Bishop Ross's sister, Giovanna. Although this is dated 1506, and she died in 1502, but it could have been a posthumous commission by Bishop Rossi as a memento of his sister. And in the landscape, there's... Um, a young woman in white and gold leaning against a laurel tree in the centre and she's ignoring two satyrs, one female on the left peeping round a tree and one male on the right symbolising on the left lust and on the right intoxication. And a putto pours a cascade of white flowers down over her. So it can be read as a choice between virtue and pleasure, and the young lady is ignoring temptation and is being rewarded with a cascade of flowers. Uh, such symbolism on the lid of a portrait was regarded as um, quite appropriate, these sort of moralising themes. It, it can be contrasted, by the way, with um, this portrait by Giorgione, painted about the same time, uh, 1506, and it's called Laura, or Portrait of a Young Bride, and it's either a young bride with a bared breast indicating fecundity, or it's a courtesan, and we know at this time there was a new type of portrait being painted in Venice called a uh, belle, or beauty, and they were often courtesans in a state of undress, and it wasn't meant to represent the courtesan as a person. It wasn't a portrait. It was meant to, meant to represent the ideal of beauty. The aim, um, of course, was to titillate, whereas Lotto's portrait was of um, a respectable female portrait, uh, typical of his work, a uh, very respectable uh, middle-class people. This work is generally ascribed to his stay in Treviso. Uh, incidentally, a small city. It's, um, as you saw on the map, it's about 20 kilometres north of Venice. Here we see again extreme attention to detail. Slight imperfections of the skin are represented, the elongated nose, the soft hair, framed uh, cleverly by the, the dark hat and clothes, which are set against a white brocade drapery with um, a green border. Top right, by the way, there's an opening to a darker background with a lighted lamp, if you can see there, a symbol which could allude to his personality or his deeds. Um, you could regard it as a representation of the shortness of 
human life, or it may be a reference to the Gospel of St John, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The young man, we believe, is Brocardo Malchiostro. Um, he was the young chancellor of Bishop Rossi, and in fact, he was um, planning to be with him during the attempted assassination plot. The, the brocade, by the way, has got another symbol in it. It's um, the brocade itself in Italian is broccato and the thistle pattern on the brocade is in Italian cardo for thistle. So broccato cardo is, um, if you say it quickly, sounds like his name, broccado. And so the hidden symbolism is a uh, reference to the name of the person. This is um, a work by Titian and what I thought I would do is just step aside briefly from Lotto's work to put it in the context of the other sorts of portraits that were being painted at the time. This is a um, portra portrait of Gerolamo Barbarigo about 1510 and 1510 was the period known as the High Renaissance. That was a, a period of art from the early 1490s to about 1527. The, the exact date 1527 is because it was the year that Rome was sacked by imperial troops. And the High Renaissance centred on Rome and Florence, where there were three towering figures, Leonardo, da Vinci, Michelangelo and Raphael. And then in addition, there was another school of art centred on Venice, whose most significant artist was Titian, followed by Bellini and, shown here, Giorgione. Titian was known as the sun amidst small stars. And his painting methods had a, a profound effect and influence, not only on painters of the Renaissance, but on future generations of Western art. Uh, for example, uh, the influence of his work on Rembrandt. This is um, a self-portrait by the Dutch artist over a hundred years later. So Lotto was competing for commissions with some of the greatest artists of Western art. I'd also uh, put Lotto in context by taking a particular picture, a religious picture by Lotto and comparing it with how other artists had represented the same scene and how it had changed over a hundred year period. This is Lotto's version of the biblical story of Judith and Holofernes. It tells the story of how Judith, who was a beautiful widow, was able to enter the tent of Holofernes because he desired her. He was an Assyrian general and he was the following day about to destroy her home city of um, Bethulia. Overcome with drink, he passed out and was decapitated by Judith and his head was taken away in a basket and often uh, she is shown uh, with an elderly female servant who is often shown uh, carrying the head in a basket. As we see here, you can see the head at the, bo at the bottom and the, the female servant behind her. Artists choose one of two possible scenes, either the, the head that's been decapitated or the um, process of um, decapitation itself. This is a slightly earlier work by Giorgione, more symbolic rendition. 
Judith is shown after the deed stepping on the head of Fer Holofernes. So it, it's not um, intended as an accurate representation of the event. It's symbolic. Lotto's perhaps moves more towards realism and the actual event. And then some 90 years later, Caravaggio shows the deed itself in all its gory detail with Judith looking determined, perhaps a little um, puzzled. Uh, this is a Baroque painting with more emotion, more action added to bring the biblical story to life. And note the development um, associated with Caravaggio of chiaroscuro, light and dark, this um, strong side lighting to add to the power and theatricality of the picture. And then finally, I thought I would show you Artemisia Gentileschi's um, picture of the same uh, story. Inspired by Caravaggio, equally determined Judith, Judith, but here one who shows no sign of puzzlement or doubt. She's really in there carrying out the action with all of her strength. So we can see where Lotto's picture falls in this sequence of over a hundred years. It's an early representation of the deed itself, um, but without showing the, um, the, the gory detail of the Baroque interpretation. This is a painting of a physician, a man of considerable wealth and learning. The notes or perhaps letters he holds in his right hand, a bit difficult to read, but they refer to the way he was addressed. Escalapio or Asclepius, who was the god, the Greek god of healing. And in his other hand, he holds a book by Galen, the ancient author of medical textbooks. And you can see behind him there's um, square pieces of paper by the inkstand which are uh, prescriptions he's written out for patients. He's Giovanni Agostino della Torre and he died in 1535 aged 81. So when this was painted he was about 61. The person behind him is his son, who was a wealthy and powerful political figure in Bergamo at the time. And um, some art historians believe the sum was added later simply because of the, the awkward arrangement of the figures. He, he sort of stuck in behind and maybe a bit too close to the father. Uh, but But there's no real evidence that he was added later. So in Bergamo, where remember he lived between 1513 and 1526, he painted all of the influential families of Bergamo. Um, this or these are two members of the Cassotti family, wealthy textile merchants, and the, these wealthy families typically used art to demonstrate their social ascent. This work was commissioned in 1523 by Zanin Cassotti to celebrate his son's wedding. So this is his son and daughter-in-law. We know from his accounts book that he originally priced this at 30 escudos but we know also that Zanin um, eventually only paid 20. The, um, the wife, whose name is Faustina, was a member of the another wealthy family of aristocrats, the Aconites. And so through this marriage, the Cassottis, who were merchants, established a link with the local aristocracy. And the portrait is rich in symbolism. Let me go through a bit of it. You can see Cupid behind, smiling, placing a yoke on the young couple. 
in reference to their marriage obligations, but from the yoke is growing a laurel, symbol of virtue, a reference to the fidelity between the spouses. And Lotto is showing the high point of the marriage, the, the, the wedding itself, when Marsilio is placing the wedding ring on the third finger of Faustina's left hand, making us, the viewers, a witness to their vows. And incidentally, the third finger of the left hand is selected because um, there was an ancient theory that a vein from that finger runs all the way dr back directly to the heart, which it doesn't, of course, but that was what was believed. She's wearing red, which was the preferred colour for Venetian blind, uh, brides. Sorry, There's a pearl necklace around her neck. That was a symbol of woman's submission to her husband. And that's emphasised by the tilting of her head towards him and her head being slightly lower than his. You might wonder, by the way, about the yoke. Um, it wasn't a common symbol by any means, and it could be it's a humorous or ironic reference to the vows of marriage. And there's a little bit more we know about the background. At the time of the marriage, Marsilio was still very young. He was 21. And at this time, the average age of marriage was 30. But we also know that the previous year, when he was just 20, his father had emancipated him, that is, freed him from the obligation to be obedient to his father and granted him part of the family fortune. And that wasn't normally done until they were 25. So his father paid for and commissioned this painting. So if there is any uh, symbolism in it, it would be the father's at the father's direction. So the yoke, is he perhaps te teasing his son and smiling or making a serious point about the son being in such a hurry to grow up and perhaps the father thinking he's not fully aware of the serious yoke of responsibility he's taking on. This is a portrait of a man holding a glove and the pose is interesting. He's looking over his shoulder and that could have been derived from this earlier portrait by Giorgione. Um, and Giorgione's portrait could have in turn been influenced by the writings and portraits of Leonardo da Vinci. The realism of Lotto's technique adds to the immediacy and the, the power of his portraits. The hand is thinly and freely painted. The gleam of the white collar and the, the, the shirt you see through the gap in the detachable sleeve um, accentuates the, the head. Like his fellow Venetians, he didn't draw his designs underneath on the canvas before painting, although there is some evidence that there were, I mean, it was formally believed that there were no designs ever drawn on the canvas. And there's now some evidence that some um, sketches, part sketches were done. But this particular painting, there's no um, sketches made on the canvas first. And so in other words, it's painted directly onto the the uh, prepared but bare uh, blank canvas. We This work was acquired by the Academia in Bergamo in 1882 from a private collection and the subject, the woman in it, was identified later from the rebus included in it. Right at the top, can you see there's a moon? I can um, magnify the moon and you can see inside it there's CI. 
which can be read as CI in lunar, or putting those together, putting the CI in the centre, it makes Lucina and the Brembati coat of arms is included inside the ring on the woman's left forefinger. So putting it together, we now believe it's a portrait of Lucina Brembati. A bust portrait, face slightly in three quarters, wearing rich clothes, um, shell-shaped embroideries, several jewels, a necklace of pearls, but also you might wonder what that horn-shaped pendant is. It was used at the time as a toothpick. And Lotto is using a more realistic approach than uh, Titian. He's showing the um, realism of the face, the symmetry of the face, the weighty chin, the sharp nose, rather than slightly idealising them. Now, according to some scholars, she is touching her womb and it could be a reference to her pregnancy, reinforced by her namesake, the ancient goddess of birth, Juno uh, Lucina. The dead weasel, if you're wondering, symbolised marital fidelity. But also in the position it's in, it could be seen as a threat to her pregnancy, neutralised by the gold hook pointed at the animal's head. Uh, but maybe I am getting too carried away with interpretation. This was painted in 1527 when Lotto had recently returned from Venice after spending 13 years in Bergamo and he was seeking to impress the Venetians and this is a deliberate challenge to Titian it's um, and one of his final paintings now in the Royal Collection. There's been many interpretations of the painting. There's many um, contrasting elements of the painting. Uh, you could see it as a contrast between Rome and Venice, between pagan and Christian belief, between nature and artifice, between the ancient and modern, and between painting and sculpture, which is an interesting one because the argument of, about which was the greater art, painting or sculpture, was known as uh, the paragone, or which means pa comparison, uh, and the, the, the argument raged and raged and raged during the Renaissance and was often uh, discussed by the artists of the period. This portrait is the success of the successful Venetian merchant Andrea Odoni, and it's one of the most innovative and dynamic portraits of the Renaissance. Odoni was a, a collector and he shows part of his collection. He's actually holding a statuette of Diana of Ephesus, symbol of nature. And his other hand is clasping a cross to his chest. And you could interpret this as a gesture where he's saying Christianity takes precedence over nature and the pagan gods of antiquity. This painting, by the way, was previously attributed to Titian, but the documentary evidence was found linking it to a painting of the same description, or the, the documentary evidence described the painting to um, suggest that it was actually this painting. It was in the collection, originally in the collection of Vincenzo Gonzaga, and the Gonzaga collection was bought by Charles I of Great Britain. But Charles I, of course, was executed. And on his execution, or following his execution, there was what was known as a Commonwealth sale of 
most of his artworks and this work was auctioned and bought by Philip IV of Spain and from there it entered the Habsburg collection in Austria and through inheritance it eventually ended up in the Kunst, Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. It was influenced by other triple portraits. There's um, a lost triple portrait of Cesare Borgia by Leonardo da Vinci. And there's also Charles I in three positions by Van Dyck. In this case, he's dressed in dark clothes. He's wearing a ring on his finger of his right hand. And in the front on portrait, he's holding, you can see at the bottom, a small object. Before it was restored, it was interpreted as a pack of cards or, or the word for a pack of cards in Italian is lotto, which was a pun on the artist's surname suggesting it could have been a self-portrait. But after restoration in 1953, it was clear that it wasn't a pack of cards. It's um, a ring box suggesting the subject was a goldsmith. And further research has now linked it to the goldsmith Bartolomeo Carpan, who was a friend of Lotto's, mentioned in Lotto's expense book. And... Um, we one suggestion is that the three versions the three foot faces or tre visi of this portrait is a pun on Carpen's hometown Treviso. It also been suggested that they are his two brothers. He had two brothers, Antonio and Vettore, who were also goldsmiths, although the heads appear um, too similar to be his brothers. Another one of Lotto's um, famous portraits. We don't know who it is. Portrait of a woman inspired by Lucretia. Uh, we don't know whether it's a respectable member of Venetian society or a courtesan. The portrait may be another challenge to Titian because it's it's unusual for Venice. It's um, he's chosen Lotto has chosen this broad format and slightly dissonant colours, emphasis on diagonals, giving it a feeling of instability, all calculated to differentiate Lotto from the other artists in Venice and draw attention to his work. Um, we don't know who she is, but she's drawing at our attention to a portrait of Lucretia about to stab herself in the portrait. Um, in in the, um, the story of Lucretia, she was raped by the son of King Tarquin. And um, the, it, it's possible that the name of this woman was Lucretia and if she was, she may have been the wife of a Venetian nobleman and the wife's name was Lucretia Valia. And so in that case, it may have been a wedding gift. <laughs> the fact that it's uh, the, the suggestion that it's a wedding gift, we don't know whether it was, is um, backed up by the small bouquet of carnations. There's an alternative theory that it's a sort of um, an ironic joke as Lucretia was a common name used by prostitutes and the jewels that are loosely tucked into her bodice wasn't normal way of wearing them and her fur trimmed costume is slightly too lavish. So it could these suggest that it was um, a courtesan, a prostitute. And in that case, the, the headdress of fake curls suggests a, a style of wearing the hair uh, that was used by women in ancient Rome, adding to the humour, if in fact it was a prostitute. 
a pale young man, finely tapered face staring into the distance. Behind him, although it's hard to make out, there is a mandolin and a hunting horn, suggesting he's put worldly pleasures behind him. And the portrait catches him in a moment of thoughtfulness. His fingers seem to be absent-mindedly leafing through pages of a large book. There's a recently opened letter in front of him by his right hand, and there's a scattering of rose petals around it, a silk shawl from which a lizard darts. So how do we interpret this? Um, he could be a melancholic, and melancholia was a fashionable malaise, which was associated with genius and artistic or intellectual pretensions. So this would say that um, the young man has rejected worldly pleasures in favour of study and contemplation. But there might be more to it. The rose petals um, could symbolise lost love or the fleeting nature of beauty and life. And some have linked this idea of lost love to the, um, the letter in front of him, perhaps from a lover. And the woman's blue shawl from which the, the lizard appears and the lizard symbolism has been debated. It could simply represent his interest in nature, also indicated by the landscape seen out of the window behind him. Or it could indicate a hidden secret aspect of his personality, as li li lizards are often known for their ability to hide. So there's something about it, there's a hidden aspect to his personality. A lot, <laughs> a lot of symbolic references are difficult to bring together into a clear theme, although that would have been clear and known at the time. Portrait of a man, possibly Girolamo Rosat, Rosati, and he's elegantly dressed. The gesture is a bit of a mystery. He's rising from his chair and possibly addressing someone, possibly pointing to something outside the frame. His other hand rests on a piece of paper, possibly a letter. And on the table, there's clover, which was a symbol of good fortune, abundance and happy marriage, and jasmine associated with purity and love, which is further emphasised by the roses on the trellis. So it could have been a companion piece to a portrait of his bride, to whom he's acknowledging his devotion by holding up his hand. Um, recently, he's been identified, as shown here, as Girolamo Rosati, and he was a high official in a town called Fermo on Italy's east coast. So if that's the case, it could have been a design for one of his important architectural projects, which maybe he's pointing to in the distance. It's a um, realistic, um, naturalistic touch, characteristic of Lotto, very different from the formality of other Italian Renaissance portraits. And then just to show you in close up the detail of the head um, that um, is typical of Lotto. A more um, difficult to interpret piece is this one, Venus and Cupid. Very, there are many paintings of Venus and Cupid produced by Renaissance painters, but there, there can be few as beautiful and, and as enigmatic or startling as this one. We, we don't know what it is. It could be a humorous wedding picture. It's an allegory, 
we see the goddess of love, uh, Venus, surrounded by symbols of fertility and fidelity, possibly blessing and marriage. In her right hand, she's holding myrtle wreath. And you'll see through the wreath, the cup cupid is urinating with evident delight onto her lap. Now, this may seem ludicrous to us today or humorous, but for Lotto's contemporaries at the time, a urinating child was an augury of good fortune. So it's been suggested that it was painted in 1540 for Lotto's cousin um, as a uh, symbol of, um, uh, of um, happiness in marriage, a blessing of the marriage. Now you might wonder about was this urinating figure unique? No, it wasn't. It was common in art. In fact, it was so common that um, a French critic has written a book called Pissing Figures 1280 to 2014. I'll just show you one as an example. This is Titian, 1523. The Andrians. It's set on the island of Andros, a place favoured by Bacchus. And you can see there's um, uh, a, a number of, it's a bacchanalia, uh, a number of um, Bacchus's followers uh, celebrating. But in the foreground, you can see again that child is peeing. This is um, Febo de Brescia, an important member of the community of Treviso, and his high social rank is underlined by his elegant clothing. We know it's um, 1543 5th or 44 on the basis of payment made, which he recorded in his accounts book, which we have, and it's described as a payment for two pictures of life-size half-length figures of his own likeness and that is of his wife Laura de Puola, which we'll see next. And I thought I'd show you a close-up to show his sensitivity, his penetrating and meticulous representation emulating Titian down to the skill of which he's painted the fur lining of his jacket. Now I said I'd show you his wife Laura. This is um, one of Lotto's finest and best known uh, portraits. Dates from his um, late maturity period. 1543 we think and um, she was the wife of the chap that we've just seen. She's shown in an unassuming attitude. She's leaning on a piece of furniture in her bedroom. And despite the informality, she's wearing a dress of great refinement, displaying luxury objects like a fan of plumes with gold chain, uh, precious rings, elements that enabled her contemporaries to recognise immediately she was a member of one of the highest ranking families of the city. And her head is a masterpiece of sophistication and refinement, her expression one of determination, thoughtfulness. Now at the time, unmarried girls weren't allowed to appear in public, so the portrait is a celebration of her status as a married woman. She's now authorised to exhibit herself and the rank she's achieved thanks to a good marriage. And this was also typical of Lotto. He portrayed local nobility. Titian um, did that, but he also painted monarchs and prelates and cardinals. Uh, Lotto focused on the middle classes. 
here's a middle-class family, a strange and haunting portrait full of mystery and anxiety. The painting's full of hands and gestures. The mother leans in, but the hand that we expect to be supporting her is turned and is holding some cherries, while her daughter's hand is grabbing cherries from a bowl while her other hand is taking a cherry from her mother's cupped hand while the father distractedly offers his leaping prancing son a pair of cherries but he's holding them just out of reach and and of course the the children are paired with their parents according to their sex so the father holding the cherries just out of reach has been suggested that it's the father teaching the son restraint but look at the landscape outside coming between them there's a smoking volcano in the background it we don't know what it symbolizes maybe the dangers of the outside world while the parents are protectively holding their hands cupping their hands around their offspring it's probably a portrait of a merchant, Giovanni della Volta and his family, because we know from Lotto's account book that um, he lived with this family in Venice. And he records in the account book that he painted um, the man and his family. And we believe that he painted them as part payment of rent he owed them when he moved in 1547. A masterpiece of Renaissance art, regarding it as, regarded as one of the finest portraits painted by Lotto, because of the subtlety of the expression, the quality of the execution. It's bold, but it's delicate. And he completed it at the beginning of his second period of in Treviso. It's a man of high social rank, painted in meticulous detail, anatomical accuracy. One could almost imagine it was painted by Rembrandt, who was of course painting a hundred years later. We don't know who it is. Some art historians believe it's someone called Libale da Pinadel, um, because there was a portrait of him mentioned in Lotto's account book in 1543. But Liberale would have then been only 47 or 48 years old, um, too young for this um, portrait. So it w that's why we're not sure who it is. Again, his account book shows he charged 20 ducats, but was only paid 10 ducats. And it was at this point that his career stalled and went sideways or downwards rather than upwards. We're not exactly sure why, but we know his expenditure didn't decrease and he descended into poverty. In 1546 he wrote, art did not earn me what I spent. So it's clear, and he's aware of it, that he was living beyond his means. He auctioned his work, but he didn't raise as much money as he hoped. And at the age of 72, he entered a monastery in Loreto as a lay brother, maybe to ensure he got a meal, a square meal every day. But he was a very religious person. Um, he died in 1556, leaving no heirs. Largely forgotten after his death, rediscovered in the late 19th century, and now regarded as one of the great portrait painters of the Renaissance. The first to truly capture character and psychological depth. 
But when he died, as I said, he fell into obscurity, was rediscovered and is now seen as one of the first modern portraitists. So thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to recording another talk in my History of Western Art series.